in a time and place when you can work from anywhere, two ladies in their mid to late 27s have decided to. And they're calling it workationing. This time, the ladies have invited a friend to the party. Susanna Weiss is a badass feminist, digital nomad, and famous writer. You know, it's been a while since we've had an interview episode. This is the Workationing Podcast. Well, hello, everyone. This episode's a little different. This is Kelly, and I am here with my friend, Susanna Weiss. Hi. (laughs) And I'm really excited to have this conversation. We wanted to do this months ago, and things just got too busy, and we didn't didn't get around to it. Susanna came and visited Carrie and I here in Amsterdam back in September, and we had an awesome time. I want to introduce Susanna. It's it's quite a mouthful to introduce you. (laughs) That's what I I love. So Susanna is a journalist, a writer that I know through PR work that I do with a client. And she is the a contributing editor for Complex and for Teen Vogue. She also contributes to New York Magazine, The Washington Post, Vice, Glamour, and just basically everywhere under the sun. <laughs> You're everywhere. And she's also working on a book, which I'm very excited about. I, I've gotten to see a little bit behind the scenes with that, and I, I'm really excited. It's a memoir. Susanna has traveled all over the world exploring questions of sex and feminism, and she's going to write a book about everything that she's found. And I think that's going to be, I'm really excited about that. So welcome, Susanna. Thank you. So I guess to explain to the people a little bit, it's it's weird how we met, right? Like, <laughs> it's kind of weird. So Susanna is someone that I've worked with a lot through PR work that I do for a client. But we were just sort of like emailing each other back and forth in like a very professional capacity at first. And then eventually we moved on to, I, I think what it was is that I, I could tell that you were really cool. I really, I, I could tell that you were, because you started writing about digital nomad stuff as well. So I started being like, oh, so who is this person out here living this digital nomad life? She writes for all these different places. And so I I think like our, our emails, I, I felt like we both kind of tested each other out a little, don't you? Like it was kind of like, I'm going to drop a little crumb of like. <laughs> it was when the conversation turned to Ibiza. Yeah. Yeah. We had a conversation about taking a pill in Ibiza. where I think we both realized like ah so Carrie and I it might be weird to invite a complete stranger to come hang out with you for a week in a foreign country but we did that and Susanna said yes and it was the day after my birthday and they had birthday decorations in the apartment I felt so welcome oh yeah I forgot about that yeah that was so fun we were so excited for you to come because you were someone who we kind of saw from a distance but we we were like Carrie and I are very committed to this creating an international girl squad of just like badass chicks and like we we wanted you for the team (laughs) so so we went and sought you out so what I think would be really interesting though and the reason I wanted to sit down with you is that our I think our listeners would be really interested in you've you've kind of taken a different approach to how you've gotten to be a digital nomad than than Carrie and I did but it's you've been wildly successful at it and I would just want to give people sort of an idea of what that looks like so how would you how did the whole digital nomad thing start for you well I became location independent before I knew about digital nomads I was working in marketing at a tech startup in San Francisco and was very disillusioned and just like trudging away at a desk and I started writing about feminism on nights and weekends just because it was my passion project and then the company sort of went under and laid us off And I sort of thought I would write like as a hobby while I looked for another tech job. But then like writing became my job. And within about a year, I was making six figures just by writing a ton for a bunch of publications. And then I learned about digital nomads and it felt like the thing I had always wanted just didn't know existed. Like I had always been couch surfing with friends on weekends and just wanting a change of scenery constantly. And I thought about it for months and months, but it seemed like a risk because I just, I had, I was in New York at that point and I just had this routine where I would just wake up and trudge out articles and just feed myself and do nothing else. And it seemed like it would get in the way of that. And then I went to Ibiza and 
that's where I met the guy who's now my boyfriend. And I sort of had, had an aha moment on the plane ride home where I was like, he lives in Germany. And I was like, you can't just go to Germany. You live in New York. This will never work. And then I was like, yes, you can. You can go anywhere. Like you don't have any pets, any obligations at home. So you really can. And I had this, I realized this on a level I hadn't before. And so the day after that trip was the day to renew my lease and I was going to and I just threw it out and plans for I actually didn't really plan I my boyfriend visited a few weeks after that and then I decided I would go to Germany to see him for a couple months and then I sort of went back and forth between there and the US and I stayed with him for quite a while and then I realized I wasn't really living my nomad dream. So since then, I've been to Mexico, Morocco, San Francisco, Belgium, where else? Back to Ibiza and all over. And it's a bit of time into my schedule like I feared, but it's also inspired me a lot for my writing. Yeah, it's so interesting. I know what you mean about that aha moment. It's I know Carrie and I really debated for a long time about doing this and even all the way up until the moment that we did it, I think we were just afraid. Like, can you do this? Because it is, people don't do this. Like people have, most people have an address. You know what I mean? Like most people have a like a, a, a normal place of residence. And But once you do it, like once you realize, oh, you actually can just get on a plane and go. It's wildly freeing and it makes you look at your entire your entire life differently I know that we were inspired by the way you did it because I know Carrie and I now we have a home base in Amsterdam and you kind of have a home base in Germany with your boyfriend but then like you still make sure that you're out there traveling doing your thing and I think that that's been that, that's been good for us to see that there's another way another way to do it because just being a straight digital nomad where you are just purely nomadic is can be a lot when you're working as much as we work. Actually, you're one of the few people I know that works as much as Carrie and I do. We don't meet a lot of people who work as much as we do, but you definitely do. What would you say was your biggest fear when you started? My biggest fear was that it would cut into my work and I wouldn't get as much work done. I have to say, I thought about this the other day. I have actually, on the trips I've gone on, I've made money back through the inspiration I've gotten. Like, I went to a music festival last summer, and I, like, met a guy who answers everyone's drug questions, and then I was like, oh my god, can I interview you? This is so cool. Then I, like, did a piece for Vice, and then I made a new connection that way and started writing for them. So I just keep trying to remind myself, oh yeah, and I went to a sex workshop in New York, last year then I got a piece on it placed in Harper's Bazaar made back the money through that payment so I just try to keep reminding myself if you do things that are interesting then it will eventually come out in your work and it'll be better for it yeah and now you have all this fodder for this book you're putting together yeah exactly so I think without the traveling I don't know if the book the book would be it would be be a very different book I bet without the traveling. The biggest inspiration for the book was a trip to Jamaica to a clothing optional sex themed resort where I was walking around naked for four days. And what struck me about it was how everyone talked about how empowering it was to women. And yet there was tons of sexual harassment and like pictures of naked women everywhere, but no men. Mm. And this same culture we see everywhere of like women should be looked at men should look at them and that was the big inspiration for the book was this problem with the way we're talking about sexual empowerment right right it's like the like the kim kardashian version of feminism it's like i posted my full ass on the internet (laughs) and look at what a powerful woman i am and it's like you know if you want to do that that's fine but like for that to be the standard by which we're judging the empowerment of, of a of an entire human you know, and like how willing they are to just get naked on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, we've bonded a lot over that. You, the when you first came out, I think neither of us we hadn't met. Like we had talked briefly on the phone before. It was mostly just work emails, so I know that that was. And I thank you for that actually, because it takes. It's like a. It's a brave thing to do, you know, to put yourself out there like that, and to. And I'm so glad that you did. And we really bonded early on when you came out talking about because for Carrie and I, we didn't start workationing as a feminist endeavor. And I don't even think that that was much on the radar for either of us. We were just trying to work at the beach, you know. (laughs) But the more that we learned and met other women who are nomadic and other women who travel a lot and started talking more about it, I think that we had so many conversations about how this lifestyle really is really beneficial for women working remotely is great for women because you don't have to wake up in the morning and put an hour and a half into getting dressed putting your face on doing your hair doing all of that just so that you can go to a job and as Carrie says uh, do work that you're you're already ready to do and so I think it starts with the remote work but the traveling part of it is actually really amazing too and I, I just feel like when I talk to you about this you always sum it up so well and so I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about because I know and you even wrote an article recently about how why being a digital nomad is sort of like your own feminist rebellion and I I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I feel like the expectation for women our age is to try to settle down with someone, think about having kids, getting married. And people still ask me all the time, like, are you going to move in with your boyfriend? When, where are you going to settle down? Um, and I refuse to settle down. And I think that's an expectation placed on everyone, but especially on women that like you should be thinking about having this stable, static life and you're sort of you live under your parents roof and then you expected to live under your husband's roof and I don't live under anyone's roof. I live on my own terms and being in a relationship. So for some like Initially, being a nomad, I wanted to assert my right to be single and not be looking and just be having fun and exploring sex and relationships in different places. With a relationship, it's also empowering because I don't depend on him. I come visit him. I think of myself like an outdoor cat. Like, <laughs> That's <so> I, funny. <laughs> like I have my, my person, but... I don't belong to him. I wander around and I grace him with my presence when I want. I love that. Yeah, you know, I was reading, gosh, I wish I could remember who wrote it. I'll put it in the episode notes. But I just read an article by someone, I think, I forget where it was. I think maybe Huffington Post, but it was it was somebody who had done those, followed those like housewife rules from the 50s. Have you seen those? Like they, they kind of, it's a meme that goes around from time to time. But it's like the rules of, of the 50s housewife is that you, you know, the house needs to be like a, a, tranquil, oasis, a tranquil oasis for your man when he comes home. And like, you should get yourself ready before he comes home like you know spruce up the kids they probably look like shit like get that dinner ready you know what I mean like light some candles make it nice for him and somebody wrote a whole article about how she did that for a week and her boyfriend didn't even notice <laughs> and like all that happened was she ended up really resenting it and I think about what you were saying about there's something about like women are really supposed to have a home like a place and then like that's their dominion and then that's the thing you you get a man and then he, you have this house together but like that the upkeep of the house like that's that's totally you and just like the labor and the hours that go into that and then like how tied you are to that place the dynamics of that are hard to escape even with your when you're with a man who might be very woke as the kids say you know or very enlightened I think that it's just so natural that the the labor of maintaining a house becomes the woman's work and when when you just eliminate that from the equation it completely changes the power dynamic of a relationship when you aren't tethered to the house and expected to maintain the house I think that's really interesting you know what else I love too is I like I love women teaming up on the road because (laughs) Carrie and I go around and everyone thinks we're lesbians all the time but I gotta tell you living single women living together in their in their 30s or beyond or whatever in our mid to late 27s as we like to say I think can be so empowering because the like you can have a domestic partnership with another person that's like like a true partnership because there's no like weird 
gender thing going on between us. You know, like we both fully expect to do like 50 percent, like everybody pulls their weight. You know what I mean? So what is, if you don't mind sharing, you can <laughs> like one of your favorite travel stories or like a, a moment that really stands out for you? This was one of, yeah, this was one of the conversations that brought me and Kelly together. I had signed up for Birthright, this trip for Jewish people. It's a free trip to Israel if you're part Jewish, which I am. And I really like to travel independently. Like I like to do my thing when I want. And I was a little hesitant about this trip from the start because I heard it was very touristy and they like put you in this bus and make you do things on their schedule. Granted, I should have realized that sooner, but me being me, I didn't. So I got on this trip and it was like from the beginning, even more of that than I thought. I just didn't like the vibe. We had to play icebreaker games, like sign forms saying we wouldn't drink and like very strict schedule like I feared. And I just had this awakening on the bus because I had been postponing this dream to go back to Ibiza. That's what I really wanted to do, but I was like, oh, but this one's free, I should do that. So I'm sitting on this bus and I'm like dreaming of going to Ibiza instead. And I emailed my life coaches at that point and I'm like, what do I do? Like I have this obligation to be here. And they're like, this is a opportunity to lean into the guilt of getting what you want. And I remember that phrase Mm. because getting what you want makes you guilty sometimes. And you have to learn to be comfortable with that if you're going to get what you want. Right. I love that. And so I'm thinking and thinking in the middle of the night and I'm researching tickets and I'm just like, yes, I'm going to do this. So I just I buy tickets to Ibiza. I don't want to insult the people running the trip. So I leave a note saying I had a family emergency. I email the organizer saying the same thing. Then I go down. It's like three in the morning. My flight's leaving in like three hours. And the guy at the front of the hotel is like, did you tell them you're leaving? And I'm like, yes. And I I don't know what to tell him. I'm like, I have to go to um, there's an emergency in Germany. And so he eventually lets me go. And then. We get stuck in traffic. I'm like, fuck, this isn't going to work. But I get to the airport and the Israeli airport people are really scary. And this woman is grilling me and she's like, I'm afraid your bag could have a bomb in it. And and then she's like, you're only here for one day. Why? And I'm like, an emergency came up in Spain and she lets me go. And (laughs) I eventually sit down and do some work. And then I eventually get on the plane. I arrive in Turkey where there's layover and my phone is blowing up and I realized I put my parents as my emergency contact which I will never do again and the trip's organizers decided it was appropriate to contact them and now everyone's calling me like where the fuck are you what emergency is happening the most stressful moment of my life so then I tell my parents I just didn't like it and I'm going to Germany to see my boyfriend because I don't know what they'll think about me going to Ibiza um and they're like okay okay we're just glad you're safe but like seriously you have stressed us out so much and I'm like I'm sorry and I tell the organizers of the trip the same thing and then I get on the plane oh and I tell my boyfriend and he's like I he's the only one who knows the truth and he's like cool have fun and then I love him he's just he's very supportive (laughs) I I think it's remarkable actually there aren't a lot of guys who are like yeah girl just go to Ibiza (laughs) have fun bye he said I want you to be the happiest Knuffelbarian on the beach Knuffelbarian means huggy bear in German oh that's so (laughs) cute (laughs) what a cutie and so then I get on the plane to Barcelona and I think it was in Barcelona that I emailed you maybe because I just like wanted to get this out like from someone who wouldn't be judgmental and I think we had talked before about Ibiza because you had told me like a pill in Ibiza was on your playlist yeah and I was like oh girl I have stories about Ibiza and so then oh yes and then you said take a pill for me yeah (laughs) and 
I was like, oh, I didn't. I tried the crystals, not the pills. <laughs> right. You were like, what is that? I was. I was like, what is she doing? It's something I'd never heard of before. But that was the first time that like our conversation had gotten, I think, like more personal. And it was just like, I remember when you told me that story later, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like when we said that, I thought it was so cool because I was like, OK, I like suspected that you were like one of us, but I couldn't quite tell. And then it was like I was like testing it to like see, you know, and just the fact I randomly chose that moment in that exact way to like signal that to you to see what you would say. And you happened to be actually going to Ibiza. Yeah. And so then I got to Ibiza and I stayed in the hotel I did the time before. And my dad's still writing me emails about how I should reflect on the distress I caused. So it was kind of off to a bad start. Mm. But then I got the crystals and then (laughs) I went dancing and did some writing and had a great two days. And then then after two days, I was like, all right, I got this out of my system. And then I went back to my boyfriend and... Yeah, not sure how much detail I should go into about the actual (laughs) trip. But I guess that was like, I'm a bit ashamed about that story, but I'm also a bit like, wow, I pulled that off. Yeah, I don't think you should be ashamed at all. I think what I really love about it is that something that Carrie and I has been, it's like been a theme this year, is getting out of bad situations. And if I think women in particular are really trained and hardwired from the day that they are born to just make a situation nice like if you're uncomfortable or you don't like something or it's not what you want you're you be polite instead of instead of actually like advocating for yourself or like changing the situation or and it's it's something that comes up over and over again and it's something that we actually continue to work on because it's it's hard to overcome that programming actually you know so I love that you were in a situation that did not sound right and and was not feeling good for you I mean even just the fact that it was like hard for you to leave the hotel like you're grown adult person like (laughs) like like what I can't leave You know, and you were just like, you know what? This is not the experience that I wanted for myself. Like, I want to go have this other totally different, unstructured, positive, liberating experience. And I'm going to go do that for myself instead of staying here in a situation that I am not comfortable in just for the sake of like not making it weird or like not hurting somebody's feelings or not. And so I think that's I think that's really important, actually. And so I can see why that would be such a turning point. And I mean, unfortunately, when you make those kinds of decisions, often there are a lot of people who are just like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like, I expected you to do X, Y, Z, because of course that's what you would do. And you did something else. And I find that weirdly disturbing in ways that I can't quite articulate. You know what I mean? And I think you I've run up against that time and time again when you just like refuse to be stuck in a situation that people kind of expect you to be stuck in. People don't like that. But catch me if you can. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've talked about this a lot with my life coaches, how the feelings of guilt and shame come from this obligation to be a member of a tribe. And it like goes back to our evolution that because like back if you abandon the group, you know, in ancient times, then like someone else could get eaten by a tiger. So you people will shame you for abandoning a group it could be literally leaving the tribe like I did or it could be like defying their values and therefore sending a message that you don't belong to their group and people will punish you for that and that's why you need to learn to live with guilt because then nobody can control you Right. Yeah, I think that's so that's so important because it is the thing is, is that once you adopt this lifestyle and and I think that you've done it in a lot of similar ways to, to how Carrie and I have done it. Once you adopt this lifestyle, you are kind of rejecting all of the values of wherever you're from, because fundamental to that value system is that everybody is there and that they're together and this is our community and and here we are you know and when you thwart that and you're like no like I don't really belong anywhere and I'm gonna go there aren't a lot of women in you know at a certain point women settle down they they get kind of stuck somewhere sometimes and being a woman who turns their life into a constant exploration is it's weirdly threatening and you see I know that it it puts strain on relationships 
sometimes because it's hard for people to understand what you're doing. And I think that people do get their feelings weirdly hurt by it in a way that like they they know that you're they have no I mean, unless they're really unreasonable. But I think most people know like like there's no real reason to be mad. Like you haven't done anything to them. And it's like hard to explain why they're so upset. But it's it's this like hardwired response to somebody leaving the tribe as you're as you're talking about. And I know that I've had to work through that in some of my relationships because I can just sense that there are some people who are mad at me, but they know that they're not allowed to be mad at me, but they're really mad, but they can't figure out why. And it just like it creates this weird. I think it's also that people feel like they've played by the rules so they should get rewarded. Like if they they've been taught, like get a nine to five, settle down and then you'll be happy. And then they see someone defying the rules who is happy and they're like that's not fair like I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to so why is someone who's not you know being cooperative why are they getting all the success yeah I think that that is that is really true too well it's because every it's like you said everybody's told like you're gonna settle down you're gonna get a house you're gonna get married and then you're gonna be happy and I think that a lot of people do that because they're like and and then they get there and some people are very very happy You know what I mean? For some people, that really is like everyone's different and everyone I'm a huge proponent of everyone creating the life for themselves that they want. But I think that women in particular, people in general, but women in particular are not presented this option. I never until I started doing this myself, I never I never met anyone doing this ever. And so, I mean, I grew up in Akron, Ohio. This was not presented to me as an option, you know? So I can see why some people get a little, like, feel a certain way about it. And it's because they're like, ah, like, now I've got this house and this whatever. But, like, this was, I I didn't know this was an option, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, nobody told me. And I think that it does feel, like, kind of unfair when you're told everything, you know, your whole life. Like, you you need to do this. And this is the the only path to happiness. And then all of a sudden you find out that there are all these other paths. But you're already really locked into yours. So, yeah, it's interesting. And I think that how do you deal with because I I feel like that that dynamic and it's why a part of the reason we're, we're so dedicated to kind of finding our tribe out in the world. But that kind of dynamic, I think, does lead to this lifestyle being lonely sometimes. And I, I think that like if you go to all the like I know you're active on all the nomad boards and everything like we are. And that's like a big thing that you hear constantly from people is that like loneliness ends up being weirdly not not the stress, not the travel, not the anything. It's the loneliness that does people in. So how do you how do you deal with with loneliness? Well, I think I'm unique in that like I really love being alone, but <laughs> there's a particular kind of loneliness for women traveling alone, I think, because I recently experienced this in Morocco. There's this feeling like everyone wants something from you, and I felt like even the people who seemed like my friends like ultimately just were hoping I would sleep with them or something. Mm. Yeah. Which can leave you feeling very alone. So Cause there's a lot of hookup culture in the digital nomad community. Is I there? think I've noticed. I just think like if, if I hang out with a digital nomad dude, even just sort of in a friend capacity, it's sort of I don't know if it's just that like everybody like I'm here for a good time, not a long time. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't know what that mm-hmm. is. But I feel like there's like a lot of there's like a weird expectation of that. I have I've never had anybody get like too creepy with it, but. There, there's a lot of hooking up going on. Yeah. So how do I deal with it? Well, the Nomad Facebook groups are really helpful. When I'm going somewhere, I just post, hey, I'm in this place. Anyone else here? And then people respond. I've met some interesting people by staying in hostels, although interesting, not always in a good way. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that because I think I just love being a loner. So. <laughs> well, and I don't know if this if you relate to this at all, but I I think that I've found that I was so afraid of the loneliness and the loneliness is hard for me sometimes. But there's also something like really empowering about it because there's something about the way that women are taught to move in the world. We all go to the bathroom together. You know what I mean? Like we <laughs> like everyone's like very, very like partnered in some way. And there's there's something about just being lonely and just being like well yeah I'm lonely but I choose this this is my life this is the life that I that I want for myself and I'm willing to tolerate certain things to give to get myself what I want and also over time that loneliness just becomes it transforms into something else because there's no longer this internal expectation that I need to have this entire community around me to be valid that like I can be valid and valued just on my own and just in and of myself 
you know, without being defined by other people's expectations or perceptions of me. And so it changes how that loneliness feels. Like it changes the quality of it, you know? My life coaches call it being self-referential. Like when you are not part of a clear tribe, you start to make up your own morals. And it's kind of terrifying because you realize the morals you've been taught are not objective. And like you could do anything. You would just have to face the consequences. And then you have to really look inside and figure out what morals you actually believe in. I also find the loneliness. I have had an urge to like go back to my boyfriend when I start to feel that, but then I just sort of sit with it and I find a lot of self-reflection comes when you do that. Yeah, I think I think the fear of loneliness is almost worse than the loneliness and once you push through that like okay, so I'm lonely. And it's okay, actually, you know, there there was something trending on Twitter the other day that was alternatives to having children, hashtag, and so many people put loneliness as the answer. And I was just like, you made a whole human because you were lonely? <laughs> like you, I think there's much better reasons to have a kid than that. Yeah, like if you're looking for someone to provide compassion and care, like a child is not the right thing. No. And like, what are you putting on that kid? They're like now this kid's got to take care of you because you're lonely. And also like, like how lonely are you that like a five-year-old is filling that for you? You know what I mean? Like what is that five-year-old contributing? Just like being present, just so there's like some warm bodies around I'm like that's a terrible reason to make a human being you know <laughs> but people really and then people sit and uh, those ones are, it's loneliness everyone's like yes like 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 retweet retweet you know just thousands <laughs> they're like yeah all you lonely bitches without kids and I'm just like all right sure <laughs> like I, I question your premise <laughs> you know well I think that about covers it I I feel like we'll probably have you back on because I think that like this has been like an evolve if you would like to at some point like an evolving conversation I value that so much about our friendship like I feel like we have it's great to find someone else in the world who's living this way and that we can like exchange ideas and we weirdly seem to be going through similar stuff at the same time and like it's it's been like an evolving conversation that's been really valuable to me so thanks for taking that risk and coming to see us back in September and I'm excited for all of our future adventure. Thank you. Me too. All right. We will put all kinds of info in the in the episode notes. So if you are interested in following Susanna online, you should absolutely do that. I'll post all of her pertinent information on there. And as well as, oh, let's plug real quick. You're, you're doing that, the live This Week in Sex? Yeah, I do a weekly chat about sex through the online sex ed platform O-School, O.School. Every Monday night, I analyze the sex-related news of the past week. That's really cool. So we'll make sure that we put all of that info in there, too, so that people can, can find that. And I think, I think that wraps it. Thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Workationing Podcast. If you like what you've heard here, please consider donating at patreon.com backslash workationing. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. All proceeds will go towards funding our bucket list items. To keep up with us in real time, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all at Workationing. Or on our website at, you guessed it, Workationing.com. That's Workationing.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode.